We were really privileged to be able to welcome Brandon Steckler onto the Mechanic Mindset Live lessons this week, where we discussed insulin pressure and pulse delta sensor diagnostics. What Brandon doesn't know about this subject isn't worth knowing. I really suggest you go and check out his book on AES Wave, where there are 350 plus pages of absolute diagnostic gold so make sure you go and check that out there's a link in the description below if you want to know how to join these sessions head over to mechanicmindset.com we've now got payment plans available for the oscilloscope training where you will get access to all of our oscilloscope courses including the live lessons uh, which we'll be looking at today so here's a short edit of the two hours that brandon spent with us uh, the other evening uh, to give you a bit of an insight to the insulin depression uh, waveform diagnostics uh, so so what is it you're doing now then what's um what's keeping you busy in the week well um i i was a technician full-time for for many years a uh, better part of 20 years and uh it's such a small world i, I recognize a couple of names on this on this presentation uh john <laughs> lampla for instance and and i'm not sure if my good friend uh danny's here dan perney i just see a uh, dan but uh Believe it or not, we used to work together at the same dealership. Matter of fact, a lot of the stuff, the, the training path I put myself on was because of these two knuckleheads. Wow. <laughs> I seen if you apply yourself, you know, they they did things so fluently at the dealership. They knew so much. Um, that's the person I wanted to be when I when I grew up, so to speak. So I, I really got to thank guys like Dan and John for providing that path for me to follow. If that makes oh, that's sense. That's great. Yeah. Privilege to have them in our community as well, you know. Um great com contributors to what we're doing so excellent yeah such a small world eh? <laughs> sure is and once i found out who's who's you know that they were going to be in this presentation i had to i had to chuckle at it <laughs> Excuse so me. what what would you say you you know were some of the main things that you did to help improve your diagnostic skills and you know learn how to get into some of these more i suppose what we could call it ad advanced um diagnostic techniques well, I'm, I'm sure John and Dan will agree. Um, most of what we learn at the dealership level is about the cars, the specific vehicles we are addressing. And many times I feel is that we don't know enough. You know, we know what we need to know to fix that car. But if I were to take that car out of my work bay and replace it with a car I was not familiar with, that skill set wouldn't necessarily apply to this new vehicle. Um, so I spent the first probably half of my career learning like that. And I realized uh, after attending some aftermarket, what we call aftermarket training, the ones that were provided not at the dealership level, but for, for the aftermarket service technician, um, they learned differently. They learned, I felt they had a bit more knowledge than we did at the dealership simply because they were forced to understand how things really worked rather than how the system works on, on this particular vehicle. So yeah. once I started stepping back and realizing what that entailed, I realized I needed to understand the physics involved. You know, instead of understanding how a, for instance, a Honda ignition system worked, I had to step back and say, how do we make a spark? Okay. And yeah. that knowledge could be applied to anything, if that makes sense. I do absolutely take my hats off to the guys in the independent world who are working on everything. Uh, because like you say, they, they have got to work differently and look really you know, approach do. things differently. They, they extract a lot more usage out of the tools they have at their disposal. And they, and they certainly understand at a deeper level. And I could say that because I've, I've seen both ends of the spectrum. So I want to talk about the different strokes now, the four-stroke internal combustion engine. And for me, this is funny. I don't know if it means anything to you guys over in the UK or the other parts of the yeah. world, but, but this is just a joke. So many people want to know how this relates Um uh, to in-cylinder pressure waveform analysis. And again, this is how I, I understand it by looking at the syringe and, and how, it, how I described how it just functions. So on my screen here is a running at idle, perfectly healthy in-cylinder compression waveform. And first we have the four strokes. We've got um, as pressure increases to its highest point here would represent top dead center compression. And as the piston decreases, what would we typically, we, we would call the power stroke um, is I'm gonna to refer to now as the expansion stroke simply because 
there's no combustion taking place in the cylinder. We've removed the spark plug from the cylinder, and this is simply the crankshaft dragging the piston and rod assembly down the bore of the cylinder. And then when we get to bottom dead center, as far as that piston will go, the crankshaft continues to rotate and our piston will change directions and go up on our exhaust stroke. And this lasts 180 degrees till we're at top dead center again. At that point, once again, the piston will change direction. We will enter our induction stroke until we hit bottom dead center, which would be 540 degrees. And then we go back up on the compression stroke again and repeat the cycle. So cycle, excuse me, uh, top dead center to top dead center represents 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Now I want you to watch my syringe as I re-describe this. First of all, I wanna start at this part of the waveform and I'm gonna explain that in a minute. I know there's no numbers on this screen to designate pressure value as it regards amplitude here, but take my word for it. This is about zero PSI, okay? Meaning anything below that is what? Two right. pressure. It's, it's a negative pressure or a vacuum. Now remember, this is a running, a perfectly healthy running engine. So here in the United States, we like to use inches of mercury to represent pressures below, below uh, atmospheric. It's just a common, it's a common unit of measure, if you will. Uh, just to give you a, a hint, about one pound per square inch equates to about two inches of mercury. So if I have 20 inches of mercury, that's minus 10 PSI. So I'm here at sea level, here in the United States, I'm at sea level, and a good healthy engine a strong running engine that's sealing well, uh, I would not be surprised to see 22 inches of mercury as idle, as negative pressure being measured in the manifold. As you guys know, manifold pressure um, is the result of the pistons inhaling air. More, They're trying to displace more air than that minimum rate throttle position will allow. Does that make sense what I just said? The pistons are, try yeah, the pistons are trying to inhale air but the throttle restriction is so tiny that minimum air rate is, is allowing pressure to drop across that throttle plate. And we're actually, we're evacuating that intake manifold of air. That's why it's in a negative state of pressure. So the moment my intake valve opens, the moment my intake valve opens, pressure in the cylinder is going to be equal to pressure inside the intake manifold because they're, they're touching each other now. Does that make sense? So watch this. This is manifold pressure, we're going to call it 20 inches of mercury. So when I do this now, okay, I did my example earlier, and I can't get it to show up on the camera. I did my example earlier, looking at this, calling this atmospheric pressure. Remember, we said it's equal to what's in the room. Let's pretend this room I'm in, I'm sitting inside the intake manifold. So isn't there 20 inches of mercury in here right now? Does that make sense? 20 yep. inches of mercury. Now, I'm going to close the syringe. I'm going to go up and squeeze this and squeeze this and squeeze this. And if nothing leaks out, I'm going to produce maybe 100 PSI of pressure. If I draw that piston right back down to where I started and nothing leaks out, that, that cylinder remains sealed, what should my pressure be? If I started with 20 inches of mercury, what should my pressure be when I extend it again? 20 again. 20. 20 in the chat, yeah. So if yeah. I'm measuring that with a pressure transducer, and this is 20 inches of mercury, and then I go up on pressure and I come back down, shouldn't they be even? If this is 20 inches of mercury, shouldn't this be 20 inches of mercury? I'm just going to go over here because we're starting a process over again. If this is 20 inches of mercury, this spot right here is this spot right here. It's the same spot, just a different cycle. If I have 20 inches of mercury here and I squeeze it and nothing comes out, and I come right back down to bottom dead center, shouldn't I also be at 20 inches of mercury? This proves right here that there's no leak because they're even. If I had a leak, remember what happens to my syringe if I had a leak, watch this. 20 inches of mercury. I go up, listen to my microphone. Some leaks out. Now watch this. What's fighting me here? You guys see that? Negative pressure. Negative pressure. This would pull far down here. Let me see if I can draw this here. We, we start at 20 inches of mercury. We go up on compression. If nothing leaks out, we come down like this and we should be at the same level as we are here. However, if there was a leak, we know this would pull way down here, right? Because that would represent the negative pressure that's fighting me right now. So all of a sudden, right before bottom dead center is the one, uh, bottom dead center 180. This is pressure 
and this is time. There is a rapid change in pressure in a very short period of time. What has to happen before a cylinder, a piston can expel exhaust gases out the, the port? What has to open? Exhaust valve. Exhaust valve. So if I'm at 20 inches of mercury, I go up on compression, I come back down at 20 inches of mercury, a state of vacuum, and I open the exhaust valve, what happens to the, the, the pressure in the cylinder? Should it equalize to the pressure in the exhaust? That's what we're seeing here. I got to get rid of this cursor. Stand by one second. There we go. It moves a lot faster now. When this exhaust valve opens, that negative pressure in the cylinder is replaced by the pressure in the exhaust. It's sucked in. That's what causes this to rise. So what I'm getting at is, does this point right here have significance? I mean, right here. What does this point represent? That the valve opening. The exhaust valve opened. So then I go over here at bottom dead center, and this occurs about 45 degrees, give or take, before bottom dead center. Now I go up here on what represents my exhaust stroke. My piston is heading north towards, and the contents are being expelled out the exhaust port. Doesn't it make sense that we are not building pressure? So then yeah. we get to top dead center 360. Oh, let me, let me say that again. So assuming I had a restriction, assuming my exhaust ports were completely gunked up, or I had a restricted catalyst, or I let my ex-wife drive my car and she backed into a wall and crushed the exhaust system and my, my engine couldn't breathe. What might I expect to happen to pressure in this area here as the piston ascends towards the cylinder head? It would increase. Yeah, wouldn't we in, uh, expect pressure to increase because the contents of the cylinder are being expelled into the exhaust stream, but the exhaust stream is not allowing that contents to leave the vehicle. So pressure would increase. So then I get to the 360 mark, top dead center, and all of a sudden, the pressure drops. Why does the pressure drop? We just talked about this about five minutes ago. Why does the pressure drop right here? And that valve opens. Right. And where did the valve open? Right here. The moment that intake valve opened, the negative pressure that's stored in that intake manifold, that storage tank at an uh, uh, idling engine, is exposed to the cylinder, pulling that cylinder into that same state of vacuum. Moments later, the piston starts to descend and it continues to draw on the intake manifold and draw air out of the intake manifold. That's why vacuum stays low here. And then we get to bottom dead center 540. What happens to the piston after the 540 mark? Goes up. It starts That's going up. Right. So if this is 540 and this is where the piston is ascending, how come pressure is not ascending here as well? What's still open? Exhaust valve. Uh, valve. The in intake valve. valve. The exhaust valve will close shortly after top dead center. And I don't reference it because it's very difficult to see. We don't, we don't rely on that typically right here because it's very difficult to see on a normally operating engine. But my point here, even though the piston is increasing at this point in time, our intake valve is still open. So any air that's in that cylinder is going to be displaced back into the intake manifold. And that intake valve typically closes at about 55 to 60 degrees after this 540 mark. That's normal for that to happen. So my point is what had to happen right about here? Intake valve closed. Right, the intake valve had to close. So this point has some significance, doesn't it? And this point, that has some significance. Right. And this point as well. And the fact that we have this graft over time and we have active cursors that we can manipulate with our Pico 6 or Pico 7 software, for instance, um, we can determine 720 degrees. And we can also use our cursors to tell, much, tell us how far offset this point is from a 180 mark or how far offset this point is from the 360 mark or how far, how far offset this point is from the 540 mark, right? We can, this is intake, or excuse me, EVO or exhaust valve opening. This is intake valve opening or IVO. And this is intake valve closing or IVC. All of these points of interest is something I typically analyze. When somebody sends me compression waveforms, I like to look at what I call here these points of interest. Now, we've mentioned the even pockets and the significance. What does it mean if the pockets are even? When, when this- There's no, no restriction. There's, there's no leak. There's no leak. Yeah. That cylinder has integrity. When, when there is a leak and some of that cylinder charge is lost to another area, um, as that piston descends and we can once again draw back down, um, we will pull this pocket down further for, again, what you can see visu visually here. What's fighting me 
is negative pressure, vacuum. So here, John has displayed, his buffer has four screen captures filled. So we've got zero seconds all the way to one second. So John has 100 milliseconds per division, as you can see here, 100 milliseconds per division, 100 times 10, 10, 10 divisions is one full second of on time. Now, John did nothing wrong here, and he's clearly captured the fix. Again, we've got cycle after cycle on the screen. Again, that's the way I like to view things in a trend view, seeing cycles happen over and over again. He's captured peak pressure at about 50.8 PSI. And exhaust pressure at idle here, it looks to be idle. I can't tell from this screen without putting up cursors, of about 1.2 PSI. 1.2 is a lot better than 28 PSI, isn't it? Absolutely. So this engine can now exhale. And because it can exhale, it can now get the fresh air and fuel in. His volumetric efficiency has returned. And as a result, the engine performs as it should. So this is buffer number four, waveform number four in a buffer. I'm going to go back one more. There's three. There's two, and there's one. So there's one thing that is missing from this. And again, it wasn't necessary in this case because John captured the fault. But in my idea, this is still more of a bird's eye view. We can't see the forest for the trees. We're way too close. So what I like to do is zoom way out. And I like to capitalize on the power of this Pico scope. So I'm going to pull over a different waveform from another vehicle and demonstrate John's same technique that clearly captured the fault successfully, but just from a different perspective. First of all, I want you to see, we've got not 100 milliseconds per division, but two seconds per division and a sample rate of 5 million samples per second. Now we can ask PicoScope to gather as many samples as we desire. It doesn't mean the scope software will allow it. It'll say, I, I just can't do that, I'm not capable. So it's gonna do the best job it can. And what we've actually captured was 300,000 samples per second, which is way more than enough for some, a slow signal like a pressure transducer signal. What we have here, again, at two seconds per division, we've got a total of 20 seconds on the screen. And here's why this is important. And this is where you guys want to take notes of this. Anytime I am capturing pressure, especially in cylinder, I want to see pressure when the engine is cranking, as I do here. I want to see pressure when the engine starts and is at idle. I'm going to switch buffers, uh, switch waveforms now to the next buffer. I want the engine to, I want to see how the engine breathes under snap throttle conditions like we have here. There's one snap, it returns to idle. There's another snap and it returns to idle. You can tell by the increase in pressure as the throttle plate opens. Oh, by the way, also when the throttle plate opens, look what happens to vacuum. Here's here is peak vacuum right here. Oop. And here is what happens when the throttle plate opens. Vacuum goes away. Why? Because we got rid of that restriction. That Those pistons can now inhale freely. So there's no restriction, meaning there's no pressure drop. The pressure drop is what makes the vacuum. I hope that makes sense. So again... Buffer two, we've got idle, we've got cranking, we've got idle, snap throttle, return to idle, snap throttle again, return to idle. We can increase RPM. And in this case here, we've power braked the vehicle. We've stepped on the brake, we've put the vehicle in gear, and we very carefully opened the throttle plate and allowed these cylinders to breathe without allowing the engine to accelerate tremendously. This is the maximum amount of load you can put on the engine. You can do this all in the work bay. And on very, very, very small occasions, I have to take this vehicle out on the road throttle to the floor and beat the ever-living snot out of it to capture a breathability fault, like a very, very, very minor restriction in a cat. But most often than not, you can do all this right in the bay. Think of it like this, guys. Um, I'm working on a big truck. Uh, what do you guys call it? A lorry, right? I'm working on a lorry, yeah. <laughs> okay? And I don't have a little two-inch exhaust pipe. I'm dealing with a big pipe like this, right? Assuming an engine has a restriction, excuse me, a catalytic converter or an exhaust stream has a restriction. What's going to be easier? What's going to show the restriction easier, a small pipe or a large pipe? Small pipe. Okay. A, a small pipe, right? Because there's less area to fill. A restriction only becomes a problem when it's truly a restriction. And if that exhaust pipe is not filled to capacity, 
the restriction means nothing. Makes sense? I could put my finger over the spigot on a, or what do you guys call it? A water tap, right? I could put my finger over the water tap and cover it 90% of the way. And if I just open up the valves a little bit so water will trickle, the restriction of my thumb means absolutely nothing. But when I open it up and I ask for more volume and I start getting sprayed with water, that's when that restriction becomes a problem. The same holds true with any type of restriction. So getting some so volume of gases down there. That's exactly yeah, right. So show it up, um, yeah. Darren, I had a really close friend of mine from Florida call me one time and said, Brandon, just like John here, I 100% know I got a catalytic converter restriction. I know I do. It's in all the data. However, I wanted to prove it with the pressure transducer. And guess what? I did exactly what John Lamp did and it doesn't show a restriction. And then I snapped the throttle and that doesn't show a restriction. I don't understand. And I said, what are you working on? He told me a, a big lorry, right? A big truck with a big pipe like this. I said, do me a favor. I want you to climb in the truck in the bay right now and, and put the car in gear. And I want you to hold the throttle to the floor for a few seconds. And after a few seconds, the exhaust restriction started to reveal itself. Does that make sense? Because he had like to, to fill up. Yeah. Right. He had to pump enough air into that system for the, and he could have repeated this process on the road when he felt the symptom. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at guys here is capitalize on the, on the, the power of your scope. The Pico scope has the power of camp capturing 400 million samples in a second at its fastest capture rate. That's not what's happening here, but certainly 20 seconds of capture time will yield you enough sample rate, enough samples available to capture cranking, start and idle, snap throttle, return to idle, snap throttle, return to idle, a power break condition, and then return to idle again. I hope you enjoyed that introduction to pressure waveform analysis. And even in the full two hour session that we did in Mechanic Mindset Live, we only scratched the surface. So make sure you go and check out Brandon's book. Again, if you wanna access the regular live lessons that we put on in Mechanic Mindset and the PicoScope training plus the automotive oscilloscope diagnostics training, head over to mechanicmindset.com to see how you can join.